from the peacemakers embedded within them. We found there's no better teacher, teachers to teach peace than those that are practicing it in the middle of conflict. And so uh, we have those immersion trips to Palestine, Israel. Sammy Awad, who's on our call today, is one of those we often meet with uh, when we're in the West Bank, specifically in Palestine. Uh, and we also have them here in Tijuana, San Diego. We also do it uh, to train in peacemaking through formation. That looks like workshops and retreats and coaching and consulting and online resources like these, these Facebook Lives and webinars. And so um, our, our goal is to, to help build a theology and a practice for us to live as everyday peacemakers, that, that we understand that and we trust and we hope that God is restoring all things and that we are invited to be part of that. And, and that looks like joining as peacemakers in this restorative mission. So uh, where are we going today? This, this is, let me double confirm that this is all working. It looks like it is. Everything looks like it's working swimmingly. Awesome. Um, my buddy Matt Nault is just pinging in the comments. Hey, man, good to see you. If you are uh, listening in, we actually would love for you to jump in and say, where are you listening in from and why are you on this call? What is it that has you on this call on um, a Thursday in whatever corner of the globe you're in? We're representing uh, four different time zones just in our, our panelists here today. Um, also, some technical stuff on how to engage this. Uh, drop comments and questions into the comments thread for any of our panelists as they're sharing. I'll be and our team will be harvesting those and we'll have a, a couple different sections of Q&A directly with Ruth and Michael and Sammy, uh, who you'll meet here in a second. Um, so put those in and again, we will, we will probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll, we'll grab any that are most focused on this specific conversation. Um, Let's see, anything else I need to be saying on the, the nuts and bolts? I don't think so. All right, uh, friends, let's start with Ruth. Would you, would you share uh, just an introduction of who you are and what, what brings you onto this call today? There'll be more space to talk about your context here in the next question. Hello, everybody. Good morning, evening, whatever time it is for you. Um, I'm here, my name is Ruth Padilla de Borst and I live in Costa Rica in a intentional Christian community called Casa Adobe, and that's my context, um, uh, but I'm also part of more um, Latin America-wide movement and global movement um, called Infinite International Fellowship for Mission as Transformation. It's really good to be with you. Awesome. Thanks, Ruth. We got next, Sammy. Yeah, and I would say good evening, and it's really, really an honor to be in this uh, gathering with this group. Uh, thank you, Global Immersion, for holding these spaces. Uh, so my name is Sam Awad, and I am in, uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, this is my hometown where I live. I'm the founder of an organization called Holy Land Trust, and I'm very proud to say until recently I was the director, but I have demoted myself, which is the best decision I think I've made. <laughs> and now focusing uh, my energy and time in the programs uh, of the organization, uh, working for uh, peace and justice in this uh, land that many of us call holy, uh, but also seeing that there is a message that we could also share and take globally as well. And it's, again, uh, a privilege to be with you today. Awesome. Thanks, Sammy. Hey, uh, before Michael jumps in, thanks all of you jumping into the comments. I see you coming in from all over, uh, from New York, from Australia, from Fresno, Walnut Creek, Tacoma. Uh, keep jumping in, share what it, has, what it is that has you on this with us today. All right, to Australia. Well, good morning. I, it is, it's morning for me. It's, it was quite early when I had to get on this call, so I just jumped out of bed, did my hair. Um, Tried to make myself look presentable. <laughs> uh, my name is Michael Frost, and uh, I am a founder of a, a mission study center at a, at a seminary at a university here in Sydney. In fact, our, our seminary is right in the middle of a coronavirus hot zone, so at a, at a nursing aged care facility right next to us. Uh, two elderly Australians have passed away. Uh, a local high school shut down with the first one to do so and, and a professor at the university has contracted it. So, uh, yeah, the college that I, I come from is right in the middle of, of that zone. And 
Uh, of course, we've suspended classes, so uh, working from home and trying to figure out how to educate people doing exactly this, speaking through boxes on a screen. But uh, like Sammy, I want to say I'm also incredibly uh, honoured to have been invited into this conversation and, uh, and good to see you all. All right. Thanks, friends. Um, continue to, to comment and, and bring questions as we go here. Let me, let me set this up and then um, we're going to jump in, in in longer form with each, each one of you. Um, if you're on this call and you're connected with Global Immersion in some way, you probably have uh, some kind of connection with following in the ways of Jesus, understanding the kingdom of God as as an identity, as a community uh, that we are all called to participate in. Uh, and in these moments, it, it's, it's interesting to think of um, a phenomenon that's been happening for some time. It's way beyond this current moment of a socio-political movement towards nationalism that has been creeping across our, our borders and boundaries and into them and is manifesting itself in some very tangible, harmful ways. And uh, that's happened here in the States. It's happened across Europe. It's happened all over the place. And I would argue that our understanding of ourselves as citizens of a kingdom of God, of a kingdom family, it runs in direct contrast to any of this movement towards nationalism, that any kind of understanding of ourselves, first and foremost, of citizens of a nation state rather than citizens of a kingdom that transcends any border or boundary. And so we're in this precarious time where many of us, I think, um, are seeing the world primarily through the lens of our orientation to the nation state we happen to find ourselves in rather than a global family. And this is a moment for us uh, where I, I think some of that, th those, those cataracts that have grown in our eyes or, or ways that we've become callous to our global family are being broken down. That we see that this, this pandemic is not, uh, it, it does, it's not picking favorites in regards to nation states. It's something that we all are connected to, that we are interdependent. The way that we show up on our streets here in San Diego for me and for Ruth in Costa Rica and Michael in Australia and Sammy in Bethlehem are connected to one another. And, uh, and if, if there is a way to talk about this as an opportunity, it, it's, it's something about maybe a confession of understanding that some of us have given our primary allegiance to a nation state rather than a kingdom family. And, and our goal today is to help us build, like lift our sight lines to that kingdom family, tap into it and say, hey, what do we have to learn from one another? How do we stay connected in a way that, that shares this kingdom identity? Uh, and again, for us, organizationally, we define peace as the holistic repair of relationship. Anything that divides us, uh, whether it's in ourselves, on our streets, in our family, we trust that God's mission is to restore that. And that that means our our global family is directly connected to our my flourishing is connected to the flourishing of each of these three on this panel and that's true for all of us here and so you know many of us are probably familiar with the concept of ubuntu i am because we are that our flourishing is interdependent um and i, and I want to offer this metaphor is 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 maybe a metaphor we think about as we're hearing from the perspective of ruth and michael and sammy on this call a theologian a catholic theologian named paul knitter described a uh, worldview as a telescope that each one of us is given some kind of inherited worldview that is built upon the context we were born into the theology the politic the nation state and, and that is the, the telescope through which we see the world and, and the reality is until we begin to borrow the telescopes of others like those on this call we will never see the holistic picture of God's reign, of God's rule, of the kingdom of God that transcends any one telescope. And so this is an opportunity, an invitation really for us to say, hey, can I, can I see through your telescope so I can have a clear sight of God's vision for the world and, and vision for the identity of this family that we're part of. So with that metaphor in mind, um, I wanna to move towards, towards our panelists here. And uh, a couple of the questions I wanna kick open, and then again, we're gonna be taking in your questions, we'll integrate that into the Q&A. Uh, it, it's a two-part question. Sammy, you can jump into this first. What's, what's the reality in your context right now? I mean, you live in, in a place of military occupation in the West Bank, in Palestine, in Bethlehem. Um, what is, so what, what's a briefing on that context? The second question is, what's, what is an understanding of this interdependence uh, as a kingdom family, how does that, why does that matter right now? Yeah. Take it away. 
Yeah, well, uh, just to share that uh, I, I live in Bethlehem and specifically in the town of uh, Beit Jala, which has been uh, the, the concentration uh, hub of uh, where the coronavirus uh, has hit. Uh, not far from where I live, five minute drive from here is the hotel that has been the place where most of the people that are sick or not uh, or in their quarantine have been in. And, and the situation is very, very difficult. As everybody knows, we have been living under occupation for many, many decades now. And so we don't have the ability and the tools and the access to the resources that are necessary. We don't have that full understanding of freedom to engage in. At the same time, I have to say a, a great compliment to the people and to the leadership uh, in, in, in the Palestinian areas that are really stepping into the space in a very, very beautiful way, new way, cooperation at the grassroots level, understanding that the call to stay home is very serious for us because, again, we cannot afford not to uh, contain this as much as we can. Um, cities and towns like Bethlehem, Beit Jala, and Beit Sahur, if you've been in this area, you know these cities are very close to each other. They have been completely cut from each other, divided from each other. We cannot go uh, outside of Beit Jala, like the town that I live. So all the roads are blocked uh, by the Palestinians, in addition to the blockade, of course, by the Israeli military. And, and the, sad, the sad reality is to see something like what happened yesterday, which is in the midst of even a self-declared curfew, to really control people and to really bring this to an end, uh, the Israeli army takes advantage of that situation, comes into Bethlehem, raids the city, creates fear and terror, and arrests three young Palestinians. And, and all of the reactions and the triggers that happened after that. So, so to see people that are already at the edge, people are fearful, people are already in a place of questions and doubts, in a place where there are rumors that go out and not knowing how to deal with the people who are infected and not to, to have the, the, I don't even know what word to use, <laughs> by the Israeli military just to come in and to arrest three people as they are in their homes. And, and not that they were accused of anything. Many, one of them was actually just released a couple of months ago from the Israeli prison. And I talked to his brother today and he hasn't been involved in anything since that time. Uh, but it's a reminder for us that at a time when you talk about an opportunity and to look into humanity and look into paradigm shifting, we as Palestinians still live under a controlling, suppressive regime that, that is not even giving acknowledgement to our humanity in the midst of this and creating this mechanism where we want to remind you as Palestinians that we are the boss and still in control. So this is a very, very challenging uh, time uh, to face here. Um, to, to the second question, for me, it's about the global human family. I mean, we do talk about the kingdom as well. And I think it's very important for people who follow Christ to begin to really engage in what we have been called by Christ to do for 2,000 years and haven't done it yet. <laughs> and so as, as we connect also at the human level with the global community, for us, to go back to the teachings of Christ. And Christ was all about bringing people to the kingdom. Everybody is invited to the table. There is no difference. We cannot judge, we cannot condemn, we cannot create isolation. And the church has failed. I honestly say this, and we remember in, in the conference in Mexico, like we had this, like the, the church has failed, not just Christianity, humanity for so long. And if we don't wake up to our responsibility to ourself, to, to the faith that we follow, to the message of love and forgiveness and peace and connection that we are called to do, then, then what is the purpose of our existence? So this is a great opportunity for us to come together, to engage in the deep work of connecting, healing, listening, having compassion, not judging people for what they believe in, but opening our hearts for them and serving them. Uh, this is This is a great, great opportunity that we need to really build on and, and to, as you said, to really begin manifesting the kingdom. This is not about nations. This is like the, the amazing thing about, as we know, this virus doesn't, has not differentiated between anyone, uh, has, has made the field plain for all of us again. And so this is an opportunity for humanity to come, to engage in a process of healing and reconciliation and forgiveness for the sins that we have committed against each other, 
and for the damage that we have created and done to this beautiful planet that God created for us and has been holding us. And, and it has been suffering so much and there is absolutely no doubt that such a reaction was going to come and has come. And here is a great opportunity for us to engage in, in a deep transformative way of creating new paradigms on this earth. Beautiful. Thanks, Sammy, both for the context of the reality of what's happening on the ground there. I, th I think that's always one of the great gifts of, of these kinds of moments is, is waking up to the fact that um, the, the fears that we may be carrying with us are legitimate. And I think we, we don't want to dismiss any of that. And also we need to understand that many of our sisters and brothers as part of this human family, this kingdom family, are in contexts where um, that, that are, are in much more extreme circumstances. And, and people like myself just have to confront in, our, in these moments the privilege that I have to walk away from realities like you live with every day and like your, your neighbors live with. Um, and the invitation, the strength, and the resolve of your invitation for us to identify us as part of that family that transcends these borders is, is compelling. Those of you that are listening in, again, um, make sure to drop in questions as we go. Sammy, were you going to say something else before? It looked like you were going to say something. Before. No, I, I, I wanted to say that part of what we need to engage in is to really create a separation between the reality of the facts that are happening and fear. We cannot mm -hmm. be agents of fear at all. We cannot even talk about fear. There is a reality. There, there is a virus out there that has to be dealt with physically, spiritually, emotionally. We have to deal with it. But fear cannot be in any of our discourse at all. And, and just to say that, yeah, we could deal with the virus and, and there are mechanisms to deal with this, but we cannot be engaging in any way to promote, to engage or advocate fear as part of this. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, my friend. Okay, uh, let's move to Ruth. Uh, love to hear again what's going on in your context in, in Costa Rica and what's the opportunity for us to see this as a, a way to connect as a kingdom family, global family. Thanks, John, and hi, everybody again. Um, so I'm sitting here in uh, a beautiful spring day in Costa Rica, but Latin America is. Um, this virus is beginning to really hit. And um, many of you may not know, but Latin America is the continent in the world with the most extreme inequality. And something like this virus just brings, highlights that, right? So my husband and I were developing serious symptoms. So our intentional community we're a part of said, you know, you really should be tested because we have so many involvements in our neighborhood and um, in a in broader context here in the larger community. So just out of responsibility, we went to the hospital. Um, we, have an ins we have insurance, uh, so they took care of us. They put us in an isolated room. They ran all the tests. And um, uh, just a couple hours ago, for those of you who are asking on the chat, we actually were cleared. We have no coronavirus in our bodies. But of course, we were, in we're incredibly privileged. <laughs> Um, the most of the people in our context in Latin America are stuck in tiny little compressed, you can't even call them homes. They're shacks, they're shanty towns, there are all kinds of different names for them. But the point is, we talk about social isolation and the need to distance oneself from others in order to not pass this on. Well, however are you called to do that when you live in those conditions? Um, so in the midst of the relief, I feel for the fact that um, I'm not carrying this virus and I'm not transmitting it to my intentional community, to my neighborhood, to the old people we have coffee with every week. Um, uh, there's that burden, right? Um, and also we're in a continent where border building has been part of the political um, instrument to make sure we're all um, fearful of our neighboring country and blame our neighboring country for all the ills of our countries. So, Nica so Costa Ricans don't want Nicaraguans to come across the border. Argentines, where I'm from, um, every problem came from Chile or from Brazil. Um, so the construction of the other, the building of negative vibes and, and used um, to build antagonism 
and used for political purposes to justify all kinds of things um, is just um, a standard in Latin America. And so right now, for example, in lots of Latin America, um, some of the, the big supermarkets like Walmart is buying up all the big supermarkets and the only option other than that are small local shops and they are run typically by Asians and they're known as the Chinos, the Chinese guy, the Chinese man, the China man, right? And so now you have all these neighborhoods with these small businesses trying to make it, but they're Chinos and this problem came from China. And so now we can otherize and exclude and, and, be, um, and build even more walls. Now, one positive thing uh, in the midst of this dire picture is in Costa Rica, Costa Rica itself has many years ago, decades ago, it abolished its army. It has no army. It invested all that money that other countries are using to, to fund a standing army, weapons and build up and all that. Costa Rica has invested in education and health. So even in spite of the prejudice that has been historically built up against neighbor, neighboring countries and everything, today in Costa Rica, they are testing anybody who has any symptom, regardless of their documentation, of their status as citizens or not, residents or not, what, whoever, anybody with symptoms is being tested. So um, it's fascinating to see how these things in, are interplay with each other, right? Um, and so how does this play into our understanding of our interdependence? Um, I think one of the things that's obvious when you read reports about what's happening is that our land, our earth, was crying out for Sabbath, for jubilee, for, for quieting down our machinery, for releasing the air from the pollution of the airplanes that we jet around in, to, to just quieting down and letting us hear you might even hear the birds in the background of our, our community here because there are trees around us, but who lives with the privilege of hearing all kinds of birds singing every day? Very few of us. Um, and so um, I think one of, the, one of the kind of still small voices of the spirit to us as a global community right now is what in our lifestyle, in our consumption levels, in our rhythms, in our travel, in our just the machinery that's supporting our economic mode of living, our lifestyles and our overabundance and our lack of acknowledgement of limits, what of that needs to substantially change? And obviously I don't celebrate the virus, we, it's, a, it's a tragedy and we really pain with so many people suffering because of it. But we also want to listen to God's spirit and the promptings uh, around these issues. Yeah, Ruth, I'm compelled by um, a couple things there. One, you know, our first peacemaking practice is to simply see the humanity, the dignity, the image of God in everyone. It, it sounds simple. It sounds like Christianity 101, but to, to simply see our other as, as a fellow image bearer, as a fellow human being, and, and, and all the dignity that comes with that. And this moment is an opportunity, as, as I heard you talk about the stigma and stereotype that this moment has, to begin placing on our neighbors who look or think or believe differently than we do specifically look differently in this moment or are in a different social political circle, uh, I think is a real temptation for us right now that, that doesn't allow us to see the way we are invited to see as specifically as followers of Jesus. And, and the other piece is, that pops is this idea, like your vision now is really a, a vision of Shalom of, of, of the rightly ordered world that what is it about the trajectory we've been on? that's actually been anti Shalom. Um, that's disrupted not only the way we orient with the world, but our, our earth in general. And what is about this, that, that, that there is a bit of a, um, a trajectory shift, a confessional opportunity for us to consider what does Shalom mean for us and what we have to learn from this. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you'd offer any, any more commentary on either of those before we go to Michael, but that, that, that's certainly highlighted in what I heard from you. Well, it's definitely, I mean, I think one of the things is we typically, um, we, we are so um, anthropocentrical also, um, 
and and I think we've we've become um, anesthetized and unaware of how we really are, even in our peace building efforts, how um, much we are a part of a much bigger whole, that that is that um, we are not only economically but ecologically tied as a human um, as a human body. Um, that we, we share this common home and we are, we are made up by the components of that home. Um, and so even in, 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 in looking at the impact of this, I think that's part of it is realizing our own bodies are being touched and affected by our, the consequences of um, some of it is our indifference and our lack of responsibility for the care of the common home. Um, and and how we and how the economic and ecological the care of the of the common is um, has been is just uh, at, at the heart of part of this crisis. If we didn't have people living in gullies um, and living in the conditions they are um, um, vulnerable to the to the upsurge of the of the rivers when the floods come, um, then we would have far less. Um, amplification of this of this virus right um so this virus is just in some ways highlighting um you know it's putting the the lemon on the hidden text um to 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 tell us what mm. we to give us a picture of what we're really um yeah. living and, and the consequences of it thank you okay let's let's head out to um to michael in australia context and and the opportunity for interdependence. Uh, well, I really responded to what Ruth said right at the end there about this virus being the, the lemon that kind of brings out the, the hidden story or hidden message, because I think that's what it's doing here in Australia as well. I mean, we, uh, we are an island and uh, there's an island mentality about nationalism and borders. We have natural borders and so, um, we're also an island of a Western liberal democracy right at the end of the uh, Southeast Asian archipelago, uh, just on the edge of Oceania. And so former collection of former British colonies now part of the British Commonwealth. Um, I think there's a sort of a, 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 a collective unconscious insecurity about our place in the world and whether we actually belong geographically here. I mean, the British stole this land from in the, the First Nations peoples who had been custodians of this land for, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, lots of Australians want to kind of deny that reality, but I still think there's a, uh, an existential sense, like, do we really belong in this place? And are, are we safe from, in particular, uh, threats uh, from the North? And that was the case with Chinese uh, immigrants during the, the, the gold rush in the 19th century. It was true with the Japanese imperialist in, incursions into Southeast Asia in the Second World War. Uh, it was true with the Vietnam War and anxieties uh, which were really kind of drummed up by Americans about, uh, about a yellow peril, communist peril coming down and, and, and invading us. Uh, and, and the more recent refugee crisis where refugees from Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Syria, are coming across to Indonesia and then getting on boats and, and coming to Australia. Now, the numbers of those was, were not huge, but Australians responded in the most extreme kind of manner. And I think it tapped into this deep, deep anxiety. We're going to be overrun. You know, we're, not, we're not safe here. We don't necessarily really belong here. And in a, in a way, I think this pandemic is tapping into some of those kind of collective unconscious fears about whether we're safe in this place. So, John, the thing you were saying earlier about we we revert to nationalism, we kind of we want to pull up the drawbridge, we want to kind of you know, bolster down the borders, and for, as I said, for us, they're geographic borders. Um, no one's calling it a Chinese virus. There isn't quite the same situation Ruth spoke about with respect to, you know, Chinese supermarkets and the like. But I think it, it plays into this existential anxiety about whether we're, we're okay. And I'm sure you would have heard that over our summer, your winter just recently, we had the most extraordinary fire season sweep through our country. Now, it's not uncommon for us to have fires throughout our summer, but this was unbelievable. I mean, just about everyone was touched in some way. And then when climate scientists say to us, 
Well, we're just going to have to get used to fire seasons being that ferocious and that long. Months and months and months of, of fire, hundreds and hundreds of fires across the country. That again plays into this sense of, of, of a deep fear about belonging and place. And we took this nation from other people. Should we have been here? We're, we're in Southeast Asia. We're not Asian. Uh, who are we? And a virus like this is that lemon on that 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 invisible story, it, it brings out lots of very unfortunate impulses. And uh, I'm, I've been, to go to Ruth's story about supermarkets, I think the supermarkets have actually kind of been the lens through which we can observe this, where, you know, privileged, middle-class, comfortable people are panic buying, not just the toilet paper that we all kind of laugh about, the panic on toilet paper, but you go into supermarkets and the shelves are a quarter empty. All the rice, the pasta, all the, the canned goods, the non-perishables are all, all, all taken. And there's plenty of food. They're all in storehouses. We, we're, not, we're not in trouble. But this panic, this kind of fear of scarcity, this sense that I'm alone and that... Uh, you know, even though we talk about being a community, and strangely enough, we did come together during the fire season, but it feels like this virus has just taken us even deeper into our anxieties about the other, about the need to hoard and stockpile and protect, about our place in the world. Um, we've closed all flights uh, in and out of the country. We're, we're shutting down any kind of connection to the world. So I responded really strongly to what you were saying at the beginning, John about what does it mean for us to say that as members of the kingdom of God, the family of God, we are in an alternative society, a redeemed community, and that nationalism and borders and othering and hoarding and stockpiling and that kind of fear has no place in, in the community of, of which we're part. Uh, what does it look like for the church to speak that way? Again, as Sammy said before, where is the church in the midst of this actually saying, we have confidence in the fact that God is at work in this world and that humanity actually is capable of great acts of kindness and grace and love and that the faith community ought to be on the front foot actually modelling what this is like. I mean, most of the... Voices I hear from the church are all about how can we live stream our church services on Sunday and how can we overcome, you know, the, the kind of social isolation? How do we be church if we can't all be in the same room together at the same time? I mean, it's also raised those kinds of ecclesiological questions. And I've been, frankly, a little bit disappointed that it feels as though lots of churches have a very paper-thin ecclesiology. It's the, the whole idea of what does it mean to be the church if we can't attend a meeting together on Sunday in a specially designated building? Um, it's completely thrown people. The, the limited moral and spiritual imagination of what it means to be church has distressed me. But then more broadly, nationally, I've been embarrassed to see the way in which our church has responded to this as an existential crisis. Um, and so, yeah, I think if, if only the church was willing to actually speak into that and to say, you know, there is something more beautiful, more rich. There is a, uh, an opportunity for another way to be human in this world. And like Ruth, I don't thank God for this virus. I don't thank God for the, the, the at this stage, handful of Australians who've died, the hundreds of Australians who've been infected. But I do think it, it might very well be an opportunity for our making to really discover as Christians our identity but also our role in the midst of what in my country has become uh, a health crisis, yes, but I think an even deeper existential crisis. Thank you, my friend. Wow. In those threads of, of, of belonging, I, I think are so significant, as you, especially what you're saying early on uh, about this, this build, bringing stuff to the surface that's, that's within many of you who are the colonizers in that context, that's, that's putting into question some of those realities that maybe you've, you've, you've known about, but you're feeling in a visceral way now. I think, um, and then even how that, that informs what's, what's the leadership moment of this from a church perspective to see that, that alternative community, that prophetic 
moment uh, lived out? What's, what's the gift there? I, I'd love to hear you interact with that a little bit, but also, um, you know, w- when we're feeling that angst, that existential angst that, oh, maybe we have misstepped, uh, what, are some, what are some theological tools we have to navigate that? And, and to move into it and actually do some of the work of allowing that to be exposed and excavated so that we could find that, that belonging, that wholeness, rather than this perpetual angst we might find ourselves in. Well, I wouldn't want to say that people um, are asking, have we misstepped? I, I, I didn't want to imply mm. people are conscious of, of, of that. Uh, I'm saying that there's, a, there's an existential anxiety there, which I think, and a very deep level is about whether we belong on this land or not uh, and what our place is, particularly those of us who are Anglos, what our place is uh, in, on this island. But, um, you know, I hear people very insensitively saying, oh, well, we should get out of the cities. We should move out to the outback, go somewhere isolated and where we can be away from this. They're not intending to do that, but there's this kind of like, run, run, let's get to the, to the desert. Uh, without any sense that there are actually remote indigenous communities in those places who are incredibly fragile and open to to a pandemic like this. I mean, the swine flu went through indigenous communities in Australia and devastated them. And so, I mean, don't go to the outback. I mean, stay away from these fragile communities where there are very, very limited medical resources, very limited. I mean, you know, the medical clinic that's open you know, a few hours a day in some cases. Um, imagine a pandemic sweeping through those. So there's just a complete insensitivity to those kinds of questions. So I didn't mean to imply that people are forming that as conscious thought. It's just a, a sense that um, I don't belong to the other. I have to hoard all the pasta and toilet paper that I possibly can uh, and hunker down and be separated from the other. And but I think that the church here has an opportunity to say, no, in fact, our whole DNA propels us toward the other, that it propels us toward intimacy and compassion, it propels us toward interaction and connection. And this kind of conversation is saying, well, and not only to my neighbour, but globally. I mean, we need to hear from other voices in this respect in order to not just gain perspective, but to recognise that the, the reign of God is unfolding inexorably around the world. And uh, our limited vision of that is, is what keeps us stuck in, in fear and, and, uh, and, and self-interest. Mm-hmm. Um, before we closed down the college, uh, our last chapel service, we had a preacher from, from Mozambique who very gently and politely said, um, I understand this is you know, a really traumatic time for Australia. Your shelves are empty in the supermarket and your medical services are, are strained and uh, there's, there's great fear and anxiety and uh, people will be losing jobs and there'll be huge financial strain. And as he's saying this, I see Ruth smiling because as he's saying this, we were all embarrassedly smiling like, oh, of course, oh my gosh, this is how so much of the world just lives all of the time. But for us, it's, it's the worst thing in the world because now it's affected you know, middle-class suburban culture in this country. Mm-hmm. Yeah. John, um, can I comment just on that? I mean, I think one of the, one of the, one of the challenges is that um, even and particularly maybe in these supposedly Christian nations, there really is an operative paganism in the church. Mm. And, and, and what, what I think that is, is because, I mean, there's a, there's a lip service to the kingdom of God, to God's purposes, to, you know, worship and song. But in reality, all the imagination, the effort, the energy is placed onto the same things that our general consumer society prioritizes and holds as values. Um, and so it's, we need, we need the comfortable place. We need the comfortable house. We need this and we need that. And, and, and we also go to church and we also praise God on Sundays and, and we like our praise music. Um, but so, but functionally, truly our, our heart, our desire, our, our everything is not placed on, may your kingdom come may your will be done it is 
it is still it is it is co-opted it is focused on the very same things that are leading us into this kind of situation of a global pandemic such a good word ruth and i think it's it's a reminder you know i'm, I'm looking at sammy who's going to jump in next there's someone who uh lives in a context where it, it is normative to live in a, a state of fear and anxiety and occupation some of us are feeling some of that on this privileged side and it, and it, it is like you're saying all oh, oh now now all the alarms go off when in reality many people like sammy and others live this every single day and it's because our economy has gotten so upside down and, and so sam would you jump in uh there, the, one of the questions that came in i read i read you say today that there are some things that kill humans and others that kill humanity would you offer some more commentary on that yeah uh, i mean as we know very well there is a virus out there and there are many diseases out there that do affect us as humans and cause uh, injury and pain and death to us uh, but but for me I think what we have been experiencing and then for me it's very important the way I look at this is not to say this virus has come out of nothing out of the blue like some little mistake that happened and this this has been building for a time this has been built this energy that creates such such uh, viruses is, is a response to how we have been behaving. And I fully agree with what Ruth said now. That, and for me, the disaster is that the church has actually been leading the system of slavery and consumerism and destruction of nature and, and, and marginalization of other people and, uh, and the sense of exclusivity. And it's, 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 it's a sad reality. And all of this creates these diseases. But, but the point is that there are the diseases that kill and there are the diseases that we create that kill our soul, our humanity. And again, for some time now, we have been destroying and killing our own humanity. We have become uh, this, this fear epidemic. We've been talking about this for years. The world is living an epidemic of fear. And that is killing who we are as humans, how we relate to each other, how we see each other, how we, again, connect with nature, how we create, connect with all creation. As, as everybody's speaking, I just had this image. Our journey from the beginning has been the journey to return to Eden, to return to paradise. And since that day, we have taken every step to go further and further and further away. And Christ came to remind us and to tell us what we need to bring that kingdom, to bring that sense of utopia, of Eden, of paradise back to us. And again, we continue to do the things that push us away, away, away. And, and, and so for me, as humans, if we lose our humanity, then, then maybe there isn't a reason for us to actually exist. We, you know, we have a calling, we have a message here, we have a, a purpose in this life, especially the church. If the church loses its humanity and just becomes a system of consumerism and capitalism and greed and control and, and how much money I'm making and how many people are part of my church and my church is better than your church, it's... It's, it's, it's very, very sad uh, to be in, in such a place. And, and the healing needs to happen to heal our humanity, to reconnect with it. And I fully believe that once we do this, we will see even these physical viruses and epidemics decline uh, as well. This is the reminder for us. Yeah, piggybacking on that a bit, Ruth, you know, the next question was, how, how do we begin to, to navigate these internal barriers uh, for those of us that are in privileged places uh, that are obstacles to us to move towards change, towards this understanding of a new humanity, towards the trajectory back towards Eden. Uh, would you give some insight into what your, what your thoughts would be on that? I suspect nobody goes to the doctor unless they re recognize they're ill. Um, and so in some ways, there needs to first be a, a level of awareness. We are privileged. Um, and our privilege is built on the bent, <laughs> broken backs of these other people and on the, on the raping of creation. And so acknowledging our sin is a first willingness to confess to confront to name to name it to face it which is probably the hardest hurdle 
um, is just that level of willingness um, to, and, and, and I think, yes, this theme that's been weaving through this whole conversation is the issue of fear and um, fear, fear because we're constructing our identity and our, and our security on sandcastles. Um, and even though we say we, Jesus is Lord, and we say, uh, we might say many things, but to truly confess Christ's lordship and God's um, goodness, um, that takes a new level of faith. And so I think another is, Lord, we have some faith, but increase our faith. We need to we need to grow in the depth of our surrender to you and our and our um, confidence in your goodness and our releasing then of our own petty priorities and even our lives. I mean, we don't have our lives. There's a phrase in Spanish: "Nadie tiene la vida comprada." Nobody has purchased his or her life. You can't buy our life. Life is a gift, and 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 so there there are levels of peeling off all our accruements, all these things we build our security on, in order to let God free us to be there for others, to be fully present, to be bridge builders, to be border breakers, to be peacemakers. Um, so I think there are many, many levels, and and so much of it has to do with what happens in here with our imagination. Of, uh, of where we, what we construct our security on. Yeah, I, and it's interesting, Ruth, the word privilege is still very, I think, triggering and misunderstood by many people. And, and I hear you talk about it and unpack it. And to me, that just sounds like formation. That sounds like discipleship. That sounds like mm -hmm. a unique thing mm -hmm. from Jesus to mm -hmm. doing the professional work, the repentance work, and waking up to who we are called to be in the world, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. we often describe privilege as simply the ability to walk away. Some of us have the ability to walk away from the pain, and the brokenness, because our, we inherited something that allows us to, I have the ability to walk away from my undocumented neighbors because that reality is something I don't have to worry about. I have a blue passport. I'm good. And right now they're terrified because how, what's their access to medical care and to food? Yep. And the pain is going yep. up so there's this privilege. We just need to acknowledge it. We just need to be aware. That's what I'm hearing you say, because that's a, that's also part of our discipleship journey. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that's so good, uh, Michael. Uh, how do churches uh, that are rooted in this like survival mentality? How do they leverage this moment to change course? How might this wake up their prophetic practice imagination? Yeah, and no, I really hope that it that it does wake us up. I think. Um, I think I, I resonated with what uh, Ruth was saying before. I think there is a kind of functional paganism, not only the, the stuff that she was saying with respect to where our home lies, but also a lot of our kind of uh, discipleship has been oriented around attending a, a, a ritual uh, meeting on a, on a Sunday. And now that's been taken away from us. And I think we may look back and say, wow, that either really made us or really broke us. It, it could go either way for us. It could be a whole bunch of people, and this is a lot of ministers' fears, is a whole lot of people start coming on Sunday and uh, stop coming on Sunday and then never come back again. That's all. It's going to drain people from my church. Um, but I'd like to think it could also go the other way, that there could actually be this challenge to figure out what it means to be church and the only option for us now is for that to be, for that to occur, for that to, to be uh, worked on in in the street, in the neighbourhood, in the in, in your among your immediate uh, 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 fellow fellow neighbours and citizens. And so, I'm hearing some stories, some beautiful stories of people for the first time just let, you know, dropping a note in all the letterboxes of the, the homes in their street. Do you need anything? Uh, you know, can I can I get you anything at the store? Can we kind of form a Facebook you know, street page? Uh, there are these little kind of things that are starting to occur, hearing lots of those kinds of good stories. And I, I'm really hoping, um, I'm a bit of a hopeful cynic, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> I'm hopeful in some respects it might actually be the, the real ginger that kind of forces the church to discover 
we do need to be together and we do need to engage. That is the part of discipleship. We do need to worship. We do need to celebrate together. But we put so much stock in that that now we can't conceive of what it means to be church other than to provide either social services through big church organisations or meet on Sunday. So I am hoping an exploration of what it means for us to be in neighbourhood, to be present to our neighbours, to be to be disciples, as you were, you were saying, John. I also would want to pick up on what Ruth said before, certainly in my country, I hope that this also becomes an opportunity for uh, for repentance, for uh, for the, the church in Australia to like not just say we're sorry we stole this land from the original custodians, but to actually seek to work toward uh, uh, compensation and recompense and re genuine reconciliation in in relationship, not just in in word. Um, that's an enormous hope, but I can't see how we move forward. As Ruth said, I can't see how you move forward unless there is initially a recognition of brokenness, uh, that I need a doctor, not just for this virus, but I need, I need help for this kind of brokenness in the soul, um, to confess sin and then to, to reach out to move forward in recovering our essential calling as the people of God, the family of God, uh, in, a, in a nation which is really kind of gripped by this very, it's a, it's a, it's a silent kind of fear, this existential deep fear of the other. So we ought to be salt and light in this context, and we could be, and I, I, I genuinely hope we will be, but, but we've been here for hundreds of years on this continent, and it hasn't looked so good so far. Yeah. We not only need doctors to help us with our illness, but to remind us of our humanity, to help us with our to heal. Uh, what's killing us? What's killing our humanity? Sammy said. I mean, that's that's a beautiful word. I want to. It's it's uh, two oh four my time. I know everyone's on different times, but um, we were saying this would be about an hour. We started about ten minutes late, so if, with your all permission, we'll go another six minutes or so. And I know Michael specifically, you got to jump off sooner than later. Um, I want to go all the way to our last uh, question that we talked about, which is um, because it actually. I think it, it, it hits on some of the questions that came in the thread from all of you that are listening. Uh, the last question was, how should this inform the way we're living locally as global citizens? Uh, understanding our interdependence is a reflection of our trajectory towards peace, towards restoration, towards shalom. What does this mean for how we live locally as global citizens? Some of the comments that came in uh, were about, you know, th there's an idol of safety. That in this moment, self-isolation and, and, and social distancing feels like a socially responsible thing not to let this thing go crazy. At the same time, if we're all just living in enclaves and our neighbors who don't have the privilege to do that are going unfed, unhoused, uncared for, what's our discipleship mandate in that moment? So th there is this tension that I think a lot of us are feeling um, and also understanding the, the connect connectedness globally. So would you guys jump in on that? And uh, maybe any, let's go back to Sam. You haven't shared for a little bit. What, what's our what's our local responsibility as part of this as part of this global interdependent family? Yeah, um, I'm going to be very fast and very simple. I, I think for me, what's important is to acknowledge. Yes, there is the the need to create these spaces now for making sure that uh, the the virus doesn't spread. The challenge is when we are creating these spaces and building fortresses around ourselves when we are becoming more fearful of losing what we have than an ability to be able to share some of the resources that we are able to. So I could be physically in isolation, but that doesn't mean I have to go and empty my bank account and put $100,000 in cash in my drawers or, and, and to buy guns, which I heard in the US now more guns are being bought than any time in history. Again, mm -hmm. sadly mm -hmm. to say by Christians, people who claim to be that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to protect themselves uh, from others. This, this is not what we mean by having care and, and being, uh, yeah, preventing the disease from spreading. So there are many opportunities. We have the technologies that we can help people, that we can share our resources, we can support each other, we can take care of this. I was in a conference call yesterday, uh, an amazing woman, a leader in the Philippines, she was talking about the Filipino government asking people to go homes. And I think like many people, what is home? Cardboard boxes, millions of people. What do you mean go home? 
So this is where the opportunity for the church comes in. Yes, we can now share, we can give in our resources and God will provide. If we believe and we trust, God will provide what we need, not what we greed. This is an opportunity to be in, in safe spaces, but to be more giving than any time we have in the past. I think also I'd, I'd jump in and say that, uh, you know, we're being told to isolate in order to protect the most vulnerable, which are the elderly and those with uh, immune suppression problems. And, and so we are as, as being socially responsible. But when we do that, we create a whole lot of other extremely vulnerable people. Um, uh, and so for us, you know, it's like uh, people who work in the, the gig economy, uh, casual workers, uh, sex workers, uh, people who don't have uh, regular incomes, uh, who work seasonally, I mean, uh, they are going to be devastated by this. It's going to be, in, in order to protect a very vulnerable cohort, we're actually going to create an even larger, extremely vulnerable cohort. So uh, I, re I echo what Sammy says about being conscious of that and, and, uh, and seeking to practice generosity and open-handedness. Um, uh, it, it's going to devastate our economy, but the first people who are going to feel it are those the, the most vulnerable. And they're not necessarily the poor in my country. Uh, they might be, you know, pretty well-off middle-class people, but their their whole uh, employment prospects now are completely gone. Yep. Yeah. So very, so very concrete things then is uh, perhaps you have somebody cleaning your house or uh, caring for your children and they no longer can come, you can still pay them. You can right. pay them for work that they cannot perform, for example. And I think the, the challenge then is really there's... You there's the, as well. <laughs> sorry? And you could start cleaning your own house and pay them. Amen. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but then, so I think there's some very concrete things that are immediate, as Sammy and um, Michael were saying. I think this also, because of what, going back to where we started, this is revealing stuff that's been there the in incredible inequalities, the precariousness, the, the, all of this. And so just as we, obviously there's, there's a, an immediate response, but there needs to be, I think, a reckoning with the, with the belly of the beast, with the problem at, at under, underlying this. And so perhaps in those free times, instead of just picking up more Netflix, we could really prayerfully examine um, what, substantive changes need to take place do we need to spearhead do we need to embody in our places and be leaders in engaging beyond our immediate circle um, to recast our way of living our way of life our our, our what we are building our our livelihoods on and um, so I think there's, there's several measures that need to be responses, the immediate, the middle, the longer term, because the world is definitely a pre and a post corona. Mm. Wow. This has been wonderful, um, at least for me, and hopefully for those of you listening in, it's, it's a bit of a moment of, uh, we're all feeling this in different ways, but there's something about these conversations that does even connect virtually uh, to ideate, to build that prophetic imagination in our in ourselves, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, uh, to wake up to other people's uh, reality, to our own privileges, if if we have that. And so I'm I'm deeply grateful on behalf of myself and Global Immersion to each one of you three. Thank you for your contribution, for your life. Um, we'll offer ways to stay in touch with all three of them to support uh, their work. Uh, I want to thank our Embers community, which is our our community of monthly funders, uh, even in these moments, who are helping us have these webinars and these trainings and resources through your faithful partnership. Um, save the date, assuming all goes well, we will be in uh, Palestine and Israel in November 8 to 15. We still have some spots for that trip. Um, hopefully Sammy will see you uh, on that trip. Uh, we are Haley, who is our Director of Communications and Development, Haley Mitsui. She's actually gonna start a, uh, a daily uh, practice a daily gathering, online gathering for 30 minutes to help us stay connected and grounded as a community via Zoom. Uh, she's gonna post a link to that or uh, an image to it. So we welcome you to, to jump into that as you 
uh, maybe are experiencing more isolation than you normally uh, may in everyday life. Many of us are. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have another Facebook Live like this. It's going to be focused on stories and local practice. Uh, Jared, my co-founding director of Global Immersion, will be facilitating that with three practitioners who will offer some really tangible ways to, to live into this last question that you three just interacted with. It's at 12 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And then we have two more uh, in this series of everyday peacemaking in the pandemic next Tuesday and Thursday at 12 p.m. Uh, that will focus again on uh, Tuesday, we'll focus on practices as everyday peacemakers. Thursday is going to be with Leroy Barber and Kathy Escobar to help us discern what's ours to do. What, what, how do we actually discern in all of this overwhelm, what's our unique contribution? And so hopefully it's a helpful series uh, that we all stay engaged in. If you text the word peace to the numbers that are dropped into the comments, 66866, uh, that'll launch you into a series of resources we built to, to take next steps in your practice. So I uh, hope you can do that. Let me close with this word from Parker Palmer that I think is a beautiful commissioning uh, to us here. And so, um, again, thank you to you three. Blessings be upon all, the, all of you that are listening, that are living, that are navigating this moment with conviction and, and hopefully some growing clarity. Parker Palmer says, community does not necessarily mean living face to face with others. Rather, it means never losing the awareness that we are connected to each other. And I think that's true uh, for us as a global family. It's obviously true even our own neighborhoods right now as we're experiencing some of that distance. May we never lose our awareness of our connectedness and our community as a community on a trajectory towards shalom, towards wholeness. Thank you all. Much love. We'll see you next time. Peace. Bye.